it's wonderful to know that we have a Heavenly Father who is inviting us to know Him personally. And I pray that if you haven't yet done that, that you would do that today. Well, I am so pumped to share today's word. Can we all turn to John chapter 15, verse 18, and we're going to read down into John chapter 16, verse 4. Now today we continue in our strangely named series. What kind of blank is this? It's getting like that old show, Blankety Blanks. And I think today's message, well, it might surprise you. I, I actually expect that you won't be expecting it. We've been having a wonderful time in this series, going through these chapters, 14 to 21 in the Gospel of John, these past few weeks. And we've been learning so much about Jesus. And, and I encourage you again, get together with someone else. Read the Bible together. Read these chapters, 13, 14 through to 21 and grow deeper together. Remember last week how I said, wouldn't it be just amazing if Voyage became this chaotic, messy web of one-to-one -one personal relationships, prayer and Bible reading? What kind of fruit would come from that? Now, during our series, some, some of you have seen for the very first time and others have been reminded afresh of the depth of his love and his grace. Oh, to be chosen. Not just chosen, but appointed by God, despite our imperfections, our shortfalls and our sin. Faith in Jesus is continuous as we remain in his love. Jesus is the vine where we get the ongoing source for our spiritual life because we are the branches. And this is cause for great joy and hope, wonder and glory. Wouldn't you agree? But here's a question. Are there no painful aspects of being a Christian? I mean, is it all just happily ever after like a Disney movie? Ah, when you belong to Jesus? Well, not quite. One day, yes, but not yet. Jesus spoke about the Christian life through this final discourse, including some hard hitting facts. So you might have to just soldier up today because we're going maybe where lots of people don't usually go. So are we ready? Oh, I need my glasses. And let's read John chapter 15, verse 18 onwards. Here we go. If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you, chapter 16, verse 1, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. 
you know, the last two weeks of what kind of obedience and what kind of fruit is this? We've been in chapters 15, or sorry, chapter 15, and it's, it's wonderful, isn't it, to know that we are chosen. Verse 16 says, I have chosen you and I have appointed you to bear fruit, much fruit. But straight after this promise of fruit bearing and blessing and change lives, immediately comes opposition, immediately hatred. What? Talk about a shock. Talk about a wake up call. Wait, we just want the lovey dovey. Mm. Do you know that fruitfulness and change lives from what I interpret brings opposition and persecution? That's a note, isn't it? A note to self. Fruitfulness brings opposition. I must remember that. Fruitfulness brings opposition. You know, the disciples first hearing this, they must have thought, what the heck to? Like, what a roller coaster of a night. Jesus just saying in verse 16, you're chosen and I'm appointing you. And then in verse 18, opposition. I mean, wouldn't fruit bearing just eliminate opposition? It's not what you expect, hey. But we need to know this. We need to write this down. Fruitfulness brings opposition. And don't be surprised when it comes. Jesus knew exactly what they and us needed to hear. And he knew exactly when we needed to hear it. Hmm. But isn't this just like Jesus, hey? Like he is the king of the unexpected. If you know anything about him, it's that one moment, his invitation, it's so fascinating and generous, so compelling, and so just just beauty. And then the next, he's startling and challenging and shocking and warning, even rebuking. One thing we know about Jesus is he never glosses over difficult bits. And in the series, The Chosen, in relation to Jesus, Jesus goes around saying often, get used to different. And the the show actually has um, merchandise for sale. And oh, I would love that. Get used to different. What a reminder. In other words, get used to the unexpected when you're connected into the vine. Now, there's no doubt that these disciples would have seen and sensed the increasingly heated opposition to Christ during his ministry years, especially leading up to the cross. Like it actually says in the word that it intensified. But could they perceive they too would experience opposition once Jesus was gone? I mean, they couldn't even perceive, they couldn't get their heads around that Jesus was even going away. You can read on. They're like, wait, where are you going? let alone that the opposition would transfer to them by identifying as a Jesus follower. And that's why this night was so important for Jesus to speak to his disciples for the days ahead, so that in looking back, they would gain heaven's perspective and that they would take courage that the Spirit of God whom Jesus was going to pour out, was going to come to them in power to help them for this very reason, to be his witnesses in a hostile world. And Jesus' words are for the church today, to give every disciple heaven's perspective, to take heart in the power that God's spirit in you has been given for such a time as this. Oh, what kind of opposition is this? Well, it's one where fruitfulness brings opposition and it's not what we expect, hey? You see, there's a big problem. Many Western Christians, well, we have a hard time with hard times. So instead, we're encouraged to believe that the Christian life, well, it rarely faces discouraging defeat And if it does happen to you, then something's wrong. Instead, we're we're geared to live in this constant excitement and never wrestle with boredom. That we are to love and that we are loved. So we shouldn't expect 
opposition, hate or rejection? Where does that fit in? And we want 24-7 fulfillment and satisfaction and never be lonely or, or have doubt? And what about self-denial or daily death? I mean, these are rarely spoken of. That can't be part of the Christian life, being connected to, to the vine? Surely not. D.A. Carson, he says it well. It's not that the promises of Jesus are false and have no substance. The problem is we distort the truth by promising a crown without a cross. We too easily want the fruitfulness of a well-kept vine branch, but think little about the disciplined pruning performed by the divine gardener. How true is that? You see, th this is very popular, the, the teaching of Jesus with him being the vine and us being the branches. But many Christians say, stop at verse 17. They think it's over. And I think it's because there's a little break. If you go to your Bible, you'll see a little break and a new heading. But don't stop there. Don't stop there because it's like Jesus just took a breath and we decided to put a break and we'd stop. But Jesus goes on. There's a big thing about being connected to the vine. Because if you stop there, if you stop at verse 17, you might be disillusioned about the life of being connected, being in union with the vine. Love, obedience, fruitfulness, yes. Opposition, hatred, rejection, yes. And so today is our sixth message. I've got a lisp, that's hard to say. It's our sixth message in our series called what kind of opposition is this? Mm, now, I'm not sure how many likes and shares this message is going to get, but frankly, I don't care. Because it would be no benefit to me or to you to bypass this crucial truth. You know, like, it's like bang, smack, or smack, bang, that's what you say, hey, smack, bang, in the middle of Jesus sharing the night before he went to the cross. This is essential truth because the Christian life is one of counting the cost. It is one of paying the price. If you think it's blessings without bufferings, triumphs without trials, and witness without weariness, then be warned. You're a strong candidate to be disillusioned, shaken, even uprooted. But God didn't want this to be the outcome for his first disciples of Jesus. And he doesn't want this to be your outcome either. We, we have to get heaven's perspective. As believers, as we grow, we come across difficult truths, painful experiences and opposition, which for a sustained period, we can't understand. It's like, where are you, God? Like, what's going on? And even mature and well-trained believers sometimes find themselves in water over their heads. It's like, oh, I need air. This is hard. And it's in these places, it's at these times that Christians are stabilized by a larger perspective, by heaven's perspective. You know, I remember a young Christian coming to me for prayer during a church service. She was experiencing strong opposition at school because of her active belief in Jesus. And she was finding it really tough. It was horrible and she wanted it to stop. I mean, this is totally understandable, right? If you've experienced opposition, ridicule, rejection, loneliness because of your faith, it is no fun. And I'm not sure in that moment what kind of prayer she was expecting from me. Was she expecting me to bind the devil or ask God to make it all go away? But that's not what happened. It was like when she was sharing with me, crying, just crying, and she was standing there and she's waiting for me to pray and she's like fervent and just like, like this, her eyes closed and tears. In that moment, it was like the Holy Spirit reminded me of Jesus' words and I said, Open your eyes and look at me. 
Look at me. And she did. And I said, Jesus said that if they hated him, they're going to hate you too. If they persecuted him, they're going to persecute you too. In fact, this is evidence that you're a disciple of Jesus, that you're a child of God. And this should give you oh, great confidence to know that you are walking in the light and that you are not of the darkness. And yes, we will pray. We will pray for perspective. We will pray for strength. We will pray for endurance and perseverance. And we will pray for your enemies. Well, you should have seen her face. It changed from like, you know, just downcast and distressed to absolute delight. And pray we did. Oh, what kind of opposition is this? You know, Christians would do far better to expect times of opposition, difficulty, persecution, rejection, so that when it does come, oh, that we would know what's happening. And Jesus said in verse 1 and 4 of chapter 16, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. I have told you this. I warned you about them. You see, he doesn't want you disillusioned, shaken, uprooted. Jesus makes his disciples' future suffering a fulfillment of prophecy to strengthen them, not to weaken them. What kind of opposition is this? Why? Why though? Why such strong opposition, even to the point of death for some, when Jesus and his followers, all we want to do is bring light and love, healing, compassion and truth and grace to people's lives. We just, we've got abundant gifts that we want to give. So what's going on then? Why so much hatred? And I'm going to unpack three reasons from our reading today. There are actually more from our reading, but I'm just going to focus on three. And they are, number one, the world hates because you belong to Jesus. Number two, because you no longer belong to this world. And number three, because its sin is exposed. So number one, purely because you belong to Jesus. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. You see, being in union with Christ is to be identified with Christ. And this is what water baptism is about. It's a symbol of our identification with Christ. And I'm bringing up water baptism because it's relevant and also to let you know that James and Charlie are being baptized on the 27th of September. And if you would like to be water baptized, if you would like to know more about it, please reach out to us. So biblical baptism, what does the Bible say about this baptism and why is it so significant? And I want to let you know that nowhere in the Bible does it talk about babies being baptized or sprinkled. It is actually full immersion for the believer because babies can't understand. It's not their decision. It's a believer's baptism because they understand what they're doing. And what are you doing when you're water baptized? You are saying, when you go under that water, you are saying, when I go down, my old life is dead and buried. Just like when Jesus died, and he was buried in the earth. And when I come up out of the water, I have a new life in Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus rose from the grave, from the tomb to resurrection life. And this new life in Christ, well, it's all encompassing. It's not just one bit and we take one bit and we leave one bit on the shelf. No, this identification, it not only includes Christ's righteousness, but it also includes opposition. You see, if the world hates Jesus, the world hates those who identify with him. So I have a question for James and Charlie. 
Do you still want to be baptized? I hope so. In fact, this is unexpectedly reassuring. In an unexpected way, you know, you can know that the world hating you has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with Christ in you. So don't take it personally. Have heaven's perspective like the early apostles who, when they were flogged and abused and jailed, what did they do? They rejoiced because they'd been worthy to suffer like Jesus suffered. Oh, I get to suffer for Jesus. I mean, this is just mind blowing. It's certainly heaven's perspective. Hey, I mean, what would we do? They weren't sulking in the corner, singing, everybody hates me. Nobody likes me. I think I'll go eat worms. No, they were rejoicing to be identified in Christ, their master. Jesus said, remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than his master. You see, if Jesus is your master, if you identify with him, then you must expect to walk roads of suffering, to carry your own cross, not literal, though for some it is. Jesus was a man of sorrows who walked through the valley of the shadow of death. So do you participate only in his joy, but not in his tears? Does he alone bear the cross? Or do you identify with Jesus' teaching and submit to his lordship? And if your answer to that last question is yes, yes, I identify with Jesus, then the world hates you because you belong to him. Number two, the world hates because you no longer belong to this world. Verse 19, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. When you trusted Christ, you see, when you trusted him, you moved into a new spiritual position. You're now in Christ. And being in Christ means you're out of the world. Not physically, not in some weird way like you're on weed. Hey, man, I'm out of this world. No, you're not of this world spiritually. You've been taken out. You're no longer interested in the treasures or pleasures of sin in this world. You're no longer ruled by the ruler of this world. Now, it doesn't mean that the Christian isn't isolated from reality or cut off from the world's needs. I mean, we're in the world, we're just not of the world. We no longer belong to this world, which means that we actually look at the things of this earth from heaven's perspective. And another thing we need to know about this world is that it has a system and it's one of conformity. You see, as long as you follow the trends and accept the values of this world, you're going to get along fine, totally fine. But when you, as a Christian, someone who belongs to Jesus, refers, refuses to conform to this world because you're a new creation and you no longer live according to the world's patterns, you're going to experience opposition. And if you're not sure about it, well, you know, Beck, I've never experienced I've been... Christian for a while, I've never experienced. Well, I want to give you a challenge if you're up for the task. The next time over Smoko or, or over lunch when there are unbelievers there, talk about how important it is to turn the other cheek. Talk about forgiveness or undeserved generosity or even as practical as declaring income and being grateful and joyful to pay your taxes and to honour government and see where that lands you. You see, a believer is not just out of step with the world, they're out of place and rightly so because we have a new master, a new ruler. So the world hates because number one, you belong to Jesus and number two, you no longer belong to this world and number three, the world hates because its sin is exposed. 
Jesus said, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. You know, this is where we're getting to the nitty gritty of what's going on here. Sin, when sin is exposed, it's no fun. You see, the truth and righteousness of Jesus exposes hidden sin and it's no light matter. As we saw earlier this year in our series, Two Ways to Live, sin has many symptoms. You see, lying, stealing, jealousy, pride, they're just to name a few. These aren't, they're sin, but it's not the disease. These are symptoms. Trying to deal with, you know, lying, stealing, jealousy, you're dealing with the symptom. Think of a body that's sick and it's, uh, it, you know, you've got the flu or the cold and you've got headaches and you've got body aches and pains and you've got all these symptoms and so we take medicine to just combat the symptoms and just make it bearable to get through but the real disease is the virus that's causing the symptoms okay we get it so we have to know what the disease is because it's the disease that needs treating and the real disease of sin is rejecting God, refusing to know and believe in God. Even when God reveals himself in all of creation, even when he has revealed himself in his word and most breathtakingly and clearly, God has revealed himself in his son, Jesus Christ. In chapter 16, verse eight to 11, just a few verses down, Jesus explains how the Holy Spirit exposes sin today. He says, when he comes, he'll expose the error of the godless world's view of sin, righteousness and judgment. He'll show them that their refusal to believe in me is their basic sin. That righteousness comes from above where I am with the Father, out of their sight and control that judgment takes place as the ruler of this godless world is brought to trial and convicted. In short, the world hates because sin is exposed. And you see, the Holy Spirit living within a disciple of Jesus is like light which exposes darkness and evokes one of two reactions. Either a person will be convicted of their sin, they will realize that Jesus is their only way, that they are a sinner, and they will run toward the light. They will run and they will bow down and humble themselves and they will repent. Or they will loathe the light. The light has exposed their dirt. And instead of repentance, it causes pride and hatred. And so they run, they run into the darkness. And this is I guess this is the response that our lives as light-bearing children of God has on different people. And the Apostle Paul articulates it well in 2 Corinthians. He says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. Woo! Go away! Like they just like, go away from me! And hatred comes up. And then he says, to the other, we're an aroma that brings life. Oh, and for those people, they're like, come, tell me more. Who are you? Who is this Jesus? And Jesus said, we, we are the light of the world because his light is in us. But not everyone wants the light. Some want the darkness more than light. And so some are drawn to the light. Oh, yes, who is this Jesus? And some repel and run the other way. So in summary, we have to know that the world hates because number one, you belong to Jesus. Number two, you no longer belong to this world. 
to its conformity, to its patterns. And number three, its sin is exposed. And lately we've seen an increase of people in Voyage and other Christians that we know experience strong opposition in their workplaces, homes, families and schools. So I pray that Jesus' words to our hearts today in this message, what kind of opposition is this, will bring fresh perspective for what's really happening, will bring courage by his spirit because you are not alone. God's spirit is in you just as he was with Christ in the opposition that he faced. And in Voyage, we are to be partners in this gospel together and we are to pray for one another. And I want to do that right now. So if you would bow your heads and join with me in praying for those who are facing opposition now, whether they're local, whether they're in our church, in our city, in our nation or in the world. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you told us in advance. You warned us of what will take place with fruitfulness and life and joy. And Lord, I pray for those locally and globally, whether severe or mild, anyone that is facing opposition, I pray that you will strengthen them. Strengthen them by your might and inner spiritual strength, that they will live with even sharper conviction, that they will not compromise, that they will be given fresh, heavenly, heavenly perspective, and that they will bear much fruit. Oh, much fruit that would bring you glory. Lord, give them strength to endure and joy for the journey. And finally, finally, Lord, we pray for our enemies. We pray that your spirit would pour out on them, that you would bless them, you would save them, you would convict them of their sin and that they would turn and run to you. Lord, I, I think about Saul who went around kicking people out of synagogues, murdering Christians, thinking he was doing a good thing for God. And then when you came and you poured out your generous favour and grace and love on his life, you turned him upside down and you blessed him and you saved him and you changed him. And we pray that, Lord. We pray that over our enemies, over our families, over our work colleagues, over, our, over strangers in the street that would revile and reject and abuse. We pray this, pour out your blessing upon them in your mighty name. Amen. If you've just made the decision to believe in Jesus and to follow him, then we want to direct you to the screen because we would love to connect with you. It's important to get off to a great solid start and there are many ways we can encourage you on this great adventure of faith with Jesus. If you have any prayer requests or stories on how God has answered your prayer, please contact us so we can pray and celebrate with you.